Hello and welcome to Design Education Talk for the New Art School. Our guest today is Pontus Varnestol. Welcome, Pontus. Thank you so much, Lefter. It's great to be here. It's a great pleasure to have you. So tell us about you and your work. Okay, so uh, I actually split my time between Hamstad University, where I am a deputy professor in information technology, and I'm also uh, head of design and innovation at an AI agency called Egghead, uh, based in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, so I've been uh, uh, splitting my work throughout my career, which spans uh, roughly 20 years now. I've always had one foot in um, industry and practice and one foot in academia research and, and education, of course. I, I really enjoy teaching and have been for you know, the good part of the uh, 21st century. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. Fantastic. So, so tell us, I mean, tell us about your part in the industry. Right. So um, to me, I started out as a cognitive scientist. That's my base training. And then I did a PhD in computational linguistics, uh, doing natural language interaction, personalized recommendation uh, at uh, a, a big company called Nokia. <laughs> so back at the time was, you know, the, the leader in, uh, smart, uh, in uh, uh, cell phones and uh, the home entertainment. Uh, I was actually part of the smart home lab in the 2002, 2001, something like that. Uh, so that's where my AI journey started because we did a lot of uh, natural language understanding, dialogue and chat. We didn't call it chatbots. We called it dialogue systems back then, but it, it's, it was the same thing. So that got me started on adaptive and personalized uh, user interfaces. Uh, but I did my uh, profile in the cognitive science program was a split between computational linguistics and interaction design. So I started out... Uh, you know, 2001 or two is when I got my first job as a an interaction designer. Um, and so I, back then, you know, you were more like a jack of all trades. You did some programming, you did some interface design, you did some user research. Now those have split into separate sub-professions, but back then you, you, you could do all of it in one day, so to speak. Uh, but then I, I went into industry for quite a while in uh, both advertising agencies and uh, UX uh, agencies. Um, and I did some consultancy work for, for example, Volvo Cars and other big players, um, but also for startups uh, doing small uh, targeted products like assisting copywriters to, to write better copy using AI. That was way before we saw ChatGPT and those kind of things. Um, but we were too early, so it didn't really fly. <laughs> but but I but I did that kind of thing for a while, and and then since ten years back, I'm um, or eleven actually, eleven years back, I'm at Hamstad University, and I've created um, a program called Digital Design Innovation along with my colleagues, uh, where we are training UX and service designers on bachelor level, um, and also going back to AI, I. Um, I realized there wasn't any any textbooks in at least in Swedish on the topic of design, human centered design, using artificial intelligence uh, as a design material. So I decided actually during the pandemic, when we all <laughs> were sitting isolated, I spent that time writing a book on it, and uh, it got published twenty twenty one. It's called uh, uh, "Designing AI Powered Services," and it came out in an English translation the year after and. Just now, recently in November, I actually released um, a second English version um, on Amazon Kindle. So there is an e uh, version of the book now, also including an extra section on generative AI, which was not part of the original in 2021. Yeah, so so that's a little bit uh, <laughs> a few things that I've done in in uh, l later years. That's really exciting. So, what made you get into teaching? I. I've always loved teaching for some reason. I uh, not only academic teaching. I've been uh, instructing in um, sports, and uh, I've been a snowboard instructor, martial arts instructor, and and so on early in my my life. So I've like teaching has always been a part. And then um, when I did my doctorate studies, there's always a teaching component part of that. Uh, so and I really enjoy that. Nice. So when I when I did got my PhD and went out into industry, I kind of uh, uh, missed teaching so much that I, that's one of the reasons I went back part-time to academia, actually, because I, I love it so much. 
Um, and um, yeah, so so uh, I, I, it's always been there for me. Um, I, I love um, discussing and talking. And, you know, th there's probably some old wise saying, like, if you really want to understand a topic, you should teach it, <laughs> right? Because it forces you to be able to explain the nuances of a topic. And I, I think teaching is a really good way to learn. <laughs> So what kind of martial arts do you practice? Oh, that was uh, uh, WTF uh, Taekwondo, uh, mostly. Okay. And yeah. uh, then some kickboxing. I have a background in Judo. Um, and now in later years, <laughs> I've uh, dipped my feet into Krav Maga. <laughs> if you know, oh, it's wow. an yes, Israeli. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but that's just hobby. Um, but is there a connection between activities. that and design? Uh, possibly uh, with the mindset, for sure. Mm. Uh, I, I don't have anything to compare with because teaching and martial arts have been in part of me as long as I can remember. So I can't really co compare what it would have been yeah, without it. But I, I think, definitely think there is a connection. I think also that, you know, because I was, I was a musician, musician uh, it's that music and, 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 and sports, martial arts, teach you discipline that you can achieve something much longer term. It's something oh, that yeah. students today are missing in terms of, you know, you're learning something now, but, that in five years it's going to flourish. It's not that 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 that, that uh, long amount of time. Right, it's not understood so easily by students today. I find. Yeah, that that's that's the ability to endure discomfort <laughs> for mm. an extended period of time in order to get <laughs> comfort at the yeah, end. That's yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a good teacher. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, how do you see in this current environment? How how do you see uh, student employment? What what can help students and graduates succeed? In, in, in this tricky, tricky atmosphere. Uh, do, do you talk about uh, the, like in general, or are we talking about AI or? We're talking about what tools or okay. what, what methodology do students and graduates need? What would be your advice mm -hmm. for so them to succeed in an ever, in an, in an ever increasing and, 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 you know, minefield of, of an environment for, yeah. for, for employability? I think, um, the, the job market is obviously changing and it is going to continue to change rapidly. And the problems that we are expected to solve, whether or not you're a designer, but especially designers aspiring to perhaps facilitate a change in the world for the better, that will require interdisciplinary or mul at least multidisciplinary work. So I think that the challenge today is that the educational landscape encourages you to be very narrow. You know, you, you, you become more and more narrow and focused, and that uh, has been the ideal. And of course, you need to specialize, but I think in order to be able to continuously address wicked problems over time, you definitely need a multidisciplinary mindset. You, you need to be able to understand the basics of machine learning as well as the aesthetics of design, but also deep ethnographic methods for user research, for example. You need to be able to do all those things, even though you might have dedicated um, professionals focusing on several things. But we need people with the holistic end-to-end, um, surface-to-core sight of, of um, what a wicked problem could be, for, for example. And currently, I think a lot of programs, they have become educational programs I'm, I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. A lot of educational programs have been really narrowing in in order to produce very efficient, uh, you know, workers, knowledge workers in, in a very particular field. You're, you're encouraged to, to pick a profile and, and stick with that and maybe even go to a PhD. And then your subject is like super tiny. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's hard to, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the, the overall picture when you do mm -hmm. that. Mm. Uh, so I think that's one thing. Another thing is to realize that the concept of a job or, or a workplace might actually change a lot in the future. We don't know, but you know, the, when, when my dad grew up, it was like, yeah, what, what workplace will I be at for the next decades? And I think that's a reality we, we're not in anymore. Everyone will shift and change jobs and assignments and uh, employment and, and so on. And you have to be ready for that. And I, I'm not sure today's education in general uh, prepares you for that. I'm not sure, but uh, that's so a suspicion. So what does today's education need change in order for to prepare for, yeah, to, to that? Um, so I, I think um, to be able to have, let's say you're an engineer, yeah. right? 
traditionally, an engineer is supposed to learn a lot about the math or the, the, the particular engineering discipline he or she is focusing on, perhaps at the expense of, let's say, ethics or um, other societal or more humanities-oriented subjects that you will need. Because let's just look at the launch of generative AI models now. They would have been in a different place, I think, if there was ethics from the start um, or societal aspects from the start, but that is somehow lacking. So I think that's something you need. And the other way around, and that's why I wrote the book uh, on uh, combining AI as a design material for human-centered designers. Typically, if you pick a design career, maybe you are not as interested in developing uh, algorithms for machine learning, right? Then you would have picked an engineering computer science uh, program, right? But as a designer, hoping to drive change and innovation in that space, you need to understand at least a little bit of that, right? But most design schools, they don't teach uh, even basic machine learning, right? So, so um, th that's what I think we need in our education. We need, uh, a, a, you know, opening up to a broader view and uh, enhance collaboration skills. Um, and that has a lot to do with what kind of identity are you propagating to students in a certain program? Are you actually encouraging, um, for example, engineers to talk to non-engineers? Are you encouraging designers to actually go out and talk to data scientists, for example? Uh, and this goes for all education. I'm just using engineering design and programming because that's what I'm familiar with. But a nurse would, would need a multidisciplinary well, education that's, that's, as well. That's really useful. So. Are you talking about the, 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 the stage before university or oh, yeah. well, university? Yeah, both, actually. Okay. Uh, but me, personally, I, I teach at university, so that's yes, my course, focus. Of course. But, but it has to start before. So this is a broader call, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you, if, there were, if you had a magic wand and you could change at your university something, what would you change if you could? There was no limitation. Whew, um, well, okay, no limitations. Then I would uh, ask us in general, I'm, I'm talking from a Swedish perspective, but I guess it's the same in, in uh, a lot of countries. But then if I had a magic wand, I would switch the um, financing of education and how we view that. Because it has to start with that, right? We, we can talk about the, uh, what we desire in terms of subjects and so on. But if we don't have enough funding, and we don't take education seriously from a budget economic point of view, nothing would happen. So it goes back to where the money is. So if my magic wand but would be to redirect funding. <laughs> That's fantastic. So let's say you solved that. Let's say you, yeah. let's say you got that. So what, right. what would you do then? Then I would say that uh, we would need teachers who are deeply trained in a lot of uh, subjects in acad academia. Um, they would... Um, have curricula that encourages collaboration between disciplines and subjects to a larger extent. Uh, also, I think, in general, I think we, we should also give um, children, youth, young adults, and even adults, actually, uh, more tips or um, knowledge regarding learning and especially how to harness your attention. Because we live in an attention economy where it's not information and knowledge that is actually the, the bottleneck. The bottleneck is human attention right now. So we, you know, if we could teach strategies for harnessing and focusing our attention better, combating you know, doom scrolling and uh, whatever social media do with us, that would be a good asset for most people, I think. Because then you could direct that attention to, to do meaningful work. And that's something we don't talk too much about. We talk a lot about information and knowledge. We talk less about our capacity for attention. This is brilliant. So you're talking about awareness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Dantapani sure. talks a lot about, about that. Uh, this is some interesting, interesting things there. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That, 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 that is very, very important, what you just said. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so where do you see this AI going? Sort of, do you, do, mm. do, you're being an expert. Where, where do you see... Yeah. It's changing in the next five, 10 years and also related to design education, of course. Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's an interesting and, and fantastic question because no one really knows. And especially if we're talking <laughs> about five years, imagine what, oh, what wow. or, or 10, right? That, that's 
impossible to, to say. What I can say, though, looking back at history, is that we will probably experience an AI winter again within those five years. <laughs> and so, that's, not something, that's not something that most people talk about today. But every time we've had like an AI high, we, it has been followed by an AI winter in some sense. And I have a feeling that the backlash of large language models might come. It might not be a, a horrible backlash, but it, we're already seeing a lot of, uh, you know, people are st stopping a little bit and like, oh, whoa, wait, uh, what about uh, bias? Uh, what about uh, the power imbalance? Uh, what about uh, copyright infringement on the training material? What about the climate and energy and water footprint of these models? And what about, you know, lots of things? Um, what does it mean for a smaller language to be put in, in um, you know, Marginal, an American large language model? What does that mean for Swedish, right? Should we build public sector on an American large language model or not, right? So there's a ton of questions popping up right now. Um, so, so I think we will see a little break in the generative aspect of AI. But let's not forget that most value creation is still on, you know, traditional supervised machine learning. That, that's easily the most value creating aspect of AI. Uh, so generative AI is currently in hype and large language models and ChatGPT is 99% is of press coverage, but 99% of the value is probably not there. <laughs> I'm sticking out my neck now. I, I don't know if it's 99% or not, but, but most of it is definitely in like predictive maintenance, your um, email spam filter, uh, directions in your Google Maps. Th that's the or the recommendation in Netflix and yeah. Spotify. That's the <laughs> that's where the value lies. <laughs> but do you see it surpassing tremendously in certain aspects uh, the, the human ability? Oh, the um, yeah. It, it, you know, there's talk about AGI now, like artificial yeah. general intelligence, yeah. and and. Um, yeah, sure. Computers have surpassed human capacity in many ways already. I mean, my pocket calculator is a lot better in arithmetic than I am. It's faster in calculating. So technology surpassing human level is nothing new. And that's why we have technology, of course. The problem becomes when, when we are too quickly uh, thinking that just because, um, for example, a uh, ChatGPT or a large language model produces very high quality language. That's not the same thing as it being as competent in language as I am as a human, because they do a different things. It's like sometimes I compare comparing a bird with, a, with an airplane. Both mm -hmm. can fly, yeah. but they do it in very different ways and for very different reasons too, uh, and on a different scale. Like, you know, uh, a little... Uh, a small bird has nothing against a jet, right? But when it comes to navigating and landing on a on a small piece with precision, the bird is obviously a lot better than the plane, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, th th that's where I feel a lot of the discussion is sort of uh, stranding, right? Like, right? People don't realize whether or not they're talking about a bird or an airplane when they talk about general intelligence. So you're talking about context that being the difference. Yeah, but also the underlying architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 this is philosophy of mind, right? And you'd have to go back to uh, Serf's Chinese room and, and those kind of thought experiments uh, to, to really dig into, is it even possible to build what we as humans consider to be some sort of mammalian general intelligence? Is that even possible to build in a Turing machine? That's the kind of questions that that we're heading down to right for a designer i want to step back a little bit and say for a designer that doesn't matter you, you don't have to to solve uh, that problem before you start using ai as a design material i'm just saying that if we are talking about the discussion whether or not um, computers or machines will surpass humans in every aspect of what we call human intelligence well then it becomes a philosophy of mind problem and we need to know a lot about the brain. We need to know a lot about consciousness. We need to know a lot about computers, uh, circuits, uh, electricity. <laughs> we need to know, uh, know a lot to, to be able to uncover that. My point is that as a designer, you can still use AI technology to 
to design AI powered services. And you can also use AI as part of your design process and design tools. That's very interesting. How do you do that? Because, because the design process has nothing to do with prompting. It's like, right. it's two very different processes. Oh, yeah. For sure. I, I guess the common denominator would be your ability to, to ask the right questions. Like if you can uh, formulate the right prompt, well, or if you can ask the right question to, to a design problem, that's the common denominator. Other okay. than that, I agree. But the, the two different things. But the design process is a process of discovery. Yeah. Can sure. AI discover or does it, does it follow the existing pool of data? Does it pull the existing pool? No, it, it, it can give the impression of discovery. That's it, the, that, and that's super critical. Everything you experience with, when you're using, for example, ChatGPT or MidJourney is the impression of yeah. something. Uh, and you as a human spectator or co-creator, you are actually providing the, the creativity in that sense. Because if, when you see the text or the image or the video being generated, that's when you put your judgment, your creative judgment on it and say, hey, that's useful or hey, that's not useful. But the model itself cannot say that. It can give the impression of doing it. The, the illusion. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but it's, you know, it's a useful illusion. That, that, that's the thing. Uh, ChatGPT can provide really great texts, yeah, but it has to be filtered through human judgment and you need to contextualize it. Uh, uh, you know, there, there currently there is no context model in the sense that we think of a context model. The context is just probabilities uh, regarding how words connect in a natural language. It has nothing to do with a deep understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. Mm. But that, you know, in certain cases, that doesn't matter because if you get use out of the tool, then it's great. It's like, uh, you know, it's like exploring does my pocket calculator understand what I'm trying to calculate? No, it doesn't have to, but you are being assisted by it anyway. Yeah. No, that's, that's very useful. That's very useful. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Uh, I think LinkedIn is the best, uh, best way. Uh, I have a website, warnerstar.com, uh, but that's basically just uh, links to other things I've done. But please feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. That, that, that's great. Um, but I, but I think, um, I'm, I'm thinking about one of your previous questions here and you mentioned process and I felt we, we went away from that. Mm. Uh, I, mm. I think process is such a great concept. And when it comes to learning and education, I think we have put a little too much weight on the final text yes. that is produced. Yes. We should assess process uh, more than the final paper or whatever we, we force Absolutely. our students to do. I get so, so that's where I think designers who are used to think a lot about process, maybe they can make a contribution in the learning space. How do we measure or how do we evaluate process as a part of learning? Well, I can, I can summarize my whole teaching in process. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you break up the stages, then you can look at it. Yeah. And that's where you can look at, for example, if there has been any AI intervention or not. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> sure. That, that, that's a yeah. useful thing. However, yeah. the problem now, let, let's say we are doing um, um, remote education and we are catering. Hamster University, for example, we're a smaller Swedish university. We are catering, though, to a global audience. Mm -hmm. and, and they are uh, taking our courses and we have students from, uh, you know, all over the world. But we don't know them the way we know campus students. Yeah. So how do you assess the learning process? Uh, that it's not impossible, but I'm saying it's a bit of a challenge compared to when you meet your fellow student face to face, day to day, and you sit with them in the studio. Yeah. You see how their work progresses Very and so different. on. Yeah, it's it's different. And, and but you can still look at what they've done from how how they've started, where they've gone, and how they've reached their their how yes. they've reached uh, the you know. If you design your teaching that way, and yeah. I think it sounds like you, you already do it, but I think a lot of courses are like, you know, for, for resources and economical reasons, you don't follow up every other day on every individual student. Let's say you have a MOOC of a hundred students or 200 students. You, you're, you're sort of, it's very difficult. yeah, let's design a final paper or final that's product. Why, that's why yeah. it needs to be Design must be taught in small groups. There's no yeah. other way for that. Yeah, exactly. And and then it's hard. Going back to what I said earlier, like my magic wand, 
Yeah, it's always about the the funding, right? Yeah. It's it's yeah. a boring answer, but getting an economy in small classes is harder than getting economy in a big group. So th- that works against Absolutely. us a little bit, right? Absolutely. It can't be done like other disciplines. It can't be done like other disciplines. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. What advice would you like to leave us with? My advice would be currently to be, uh, and I'm talking to designers now, Yeah, designers that perhaps have not touched AI in a deeper sense yet. I, I would say you have to uh, learn and you have to learn how to wield AI as a design material because otherwise other people would do that for you. And we want human-centered designers to be at the forefront of designing these services because we, we have seen, you know, s- starting from social media, algorithmic curation of that, going up to the generative AI today and other AI aspect. We have seen what happens when you don't have a thoughtful human-centered process doing that. So it's actually, I would actually claim, and I can do that now in this podcast, I would claim it's your responsibility as a human-centered designer to understand enough about AI for you to make a contribution in that space. Wow. This has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, looking forward also to seeing you in the Design Education Forum in September. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. It's been absolutely thank brilliant. Thank you, Lefteris. Thank you. Bye bye.